Reaction Alert. Who would name a title of a sermon, Reaction Alert? One thing I learned in licensing school is you want to never have your title represent the message. Reaction Alert could take on many different forms, I think you would agree. Reaction Alert. It's really the reaction of how we treat people. It's the reaction of what we say to people. It's the reaction of how we make people feel. They're not going to remember the gift that you gave them, but they are going to remember how you made them feel. I can assure you. Our thoughts, our busyness, and our practices of giving thankfulness to God slips off. And it does slip off. We must create a safety net around us that reminds us to not slip and have people in our lives that love us enough to call us out on it. We're not always lovable, kind, compassionate people. Each one of us have a side of us that are not that way. And I think you would all raise your hand if I asked you that. But to create that environment around us, creating new friends, creating new opportunities of folks around us that remind us of God's love, remind us of the practices of how to treat people. We are an example of Christ by coming here. We are an example for Christ how we treat people. That's exactly why we need to attend church. I have people often say to me, well, I don't need to go to church. I vehemently disagree with anybody that has that conversation. I would love to have that conversation with anybody. So if you're listening, send in the letters. Live stream. It was one of the things my mother and I wrestled with for years. My mother read the Bible through every year. And she was a scholar by the word. But she didn't believe she had to attend church. I didn't agree with her. And I usually agree with most things my mother said. But that was one thing I didn't agree with. I think there's fellowship among believers that strengthens us. That helps us be accountable to one another. Because we need it. We are sinners. We need to be accountable. That doesn't mean we're hypocrites. We're here today and we're all putting on our good face, our, our nice clothes. We leave here. And we right, go right back to what we used to do, the way we used to do it. We need to attend church. We need to fellowship with one another. We need to love and laugh and cry with one another. To lift each other up. Words can be devastating. They break us down. Or they can lift us up. God deserves our thankfulness. And negativity has no place with believers. And we're going to learn a lot more about that. But we have a funny that we do every week. This week we have Pastor and his wife went to the doctors to get their hearing checked. I don't know if anybody's had those kind of conversations. It's funny, my wife and I, she's on her laptop, I'm on my phone, and she'll say something to me and I never hear it. Vice versa, and it's like maybe we'll try getting off our devices. But isn't it funny how the same thing happens? <laughs> we don't hear each other. Well, they went to the doctors. Pastor and his wife went to the doctors. Get the hearing check, both of them. The doctor told them to write everything in, write everything down, and that will help them remember better. Okay. So they started doing that, and one day the pastor asked his wife to get him a donut from the kitchen since she was getting up. And she said, sure, I'm going in the kitchen. Make sure you write it down, dear. She said, yes, darling, mumbling. I'm getting tired of this writing down stuff. A few minutes later, she came back with bacon and eggs, and he said, thank you. You forgot my toast I asked for. <laughs> you love that? Give God a hand. Uh, my mom had, had, had some 
very good values. And if I said something out of line or negative, she would say, Thomas, how many, how many, what, what name did you go by when you knew that your mom and dad was mad at you? So if your name was David, it might be David. Well, mine was Thomas with a stern voice, and you knew you better straighten up. I called it reaction alert. How do we respond when we are corrected as adults? <laughs> yes, I am going there. <laughs> we don't want to hear it. My way or the highway. We don't do it that way. And we get mad if we don't get our way. Well, what message are we sending with that? Certainly the evidence is in what we say and how we say it. Let's share the selected scripture this morning. Philippians 4, 5, 2, 7. We're going to say this out loud like we mean it. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is here. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus Christ. Verse 5. If you need to take one thing home with you today, one thing home with you today, take verse 5 with you today. Let your gentleness be evident to all. I'm going to have a tip for you to follow that will change your life forever towards the end of my message this morning. Some of you already do this but you may need to be reminded. Gentleness to be evident. It is very much in line with that. I'm going to share that at the end of my message. Something each one of us can do in all ages if we're not doing it today. We must get back to thinking about what we are doing and who we are doing it for. Let me repeat that. We must get back to thinking about what we are doing and who we are doing it for. Why do we do what we do? I go back to the why. Why do we do what we do? That's something that gets wrestled with many, many people when in fact it's the, the, the basic of the Bible. It's the basic of our living, our life, and everything that we do. Why do we do what we do? If it's for the flesh and personal satisfaction, I guarantee you're going to get exhausted. You're going to get exhausted, you're going to break down, and you're going to have your long pity party. Because that's what we do. When you're lifting someone up, and you're affirming them, the exchange that happened here this morning between Lynn and... Cheryl. Cheryl. The, the exchange of loving one another and caring for one another, you have changed my life forever. There is nothing greater than that. Nothing greater than that. And how did that happen? Because people are inspired to live for the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Not live for the flesh, not live for me. Not to live because it feels good. Not to live because I have a new car. Not to live because I'm going to get this vacation home or whatever. I'm going to have my first ice cream in 10 years. Whatever the case may be. Who are we living for? And why are we living? We must get back to thinking about what we are doing and who we are doing it for. We get caught up in a trap of excessive complaining when we are stressed. The spouse doesn't, doesn't do what we ask. <laughs> Clothes don't fit anymore. Now that's everybody's fault. I'm late to the wedding. All of it's called life. All of it's called life. We're going to have those situations. 
I don't know about you, but my clothes don't fit like they used to. I have a story for you this morning. There were 27 sixth graders in a class. And I'm going to ask you to participate. I'm going to show you a piece of paper, and I'm not looking for answers. I'm going to ask you what you see on this piece of paper. In class, they asked each kid to come forward and explain what they saw on this piece of paper, but I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you the answer afterwards. To what the results was of these, these children. So I want you to think about this piece of paper and what this means to you. What do you see? No, it's not metallic or anything. It's the piece of paper. And we don't have the time for me to ask you what you see, which I would love to, but as you can start throwing maybe that. So it's a piece of paper. What do you see? So I'm going to give you the results of what the sixth graders saw. So remember what you're seeing. Don't change your idea afterwards so that you can fit in and be part of the crowd. What do you see on this piece of paper? There were 27 children. 26 of the children focused on the black dot. 26 out of 27 children focused on the black dot. Again, I wish I could ask you what you saw. Instead of the whole big picture around that black dot. Staying focused on the dark moments in our lives do not and will not afford us the opportunity to be thankful to the Lord and our Savior. Amen? Amen. When we focus in on the black dot, the negativity in our lives, we can't see the big picture. We can't see the beauty of the, the largeness beyond the black dot. We are stuck on the black dot so much that we can't think beyond that. We are pretty much trained that way. We're filling our thoughts in the wrong place and it will take your joy away. When we focus on those dark spots, the, the dot, the dark black spot on that big piece of paper, that we could see so much more than that black dot on that piece of paper, we stay stuck. We stay stuck into the pity of where we're at. And God is saying, no, I'm providing you a way to see beyond that. To see the lilies of the field. To see the beauty around you. To see the hope in others. To lift others up. To affirm people where they're at. Verse 6 reminds us that in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I was grateful for the many that participated in prayer and praise Tuesday evening. Uh, we have something new that I was trying, uh, prayer and praise, to lift up some prayers and, and a few songs. 45 minutes at the most, folks gathered here, and we also provided Zoom for that opportunity for folks to participate. No one really knew what this was all about, and it was it was one of those things to say, you know, I think I'll go try that. And uh, I was I was grateful to see so many people participate. Without prayer, there is emptiness. Prayer is the foundation and the centering of all that we do. In all the struggles that we have in life, the difficulties, if we're not grounded in prayer, there's emptiness in us. We're not comfortable. It's like when my wife and I travel, we like to visit a church if we're out of town on a Sunday. We will find a church in a town on a Sunday if we are not here. We've always done that, and Pittsburgh was one of our nicest Methodist churches. It was all wooden with beans, and it was just beautiful. And uh, if we did
didn't attend the church, if we don't attend, if we're not in church on a Sunday, our week is empty. The week long is empty. I don't know if it is for you, but it is for me. You know, I have to be in church on a Sunday. It's going to be, it's going to be a challenge if I'm not. And there's an emptiness that's inside of us. Our insecurities, the troubles and the situations and the challenges that we face, that emptiness stays there. But when we're on our knees, we humble ourselves and say, God, I don't know what to do with this. Help me, please. Without prayer, there's an emptiness. When we feel alone with our struggles, like waiting for a medical test, a mental illness, breaking an addiction, an addiction, and the list goes on. It's endless. The struggles, the hurt, and the pain that's out there in the world and in here this morning. We're not exempt. We're not exempt of the struggles of life. Prayer captures some of that anxiety and puts it on God. You may not have ever heard that. But the anxiety and the uncertainty and the struggles that we share, we don't have to share it alone. We do not have to share it alone. We are to put it on God. We are to say, God, help me. God cares for his children and for those that are obedient. And you don't have to do it alone. With obedience to our love for God, we can and should expect God to be there for us. That's okay. It's okay to expect that. He loves us and will never leave us. He loves the faithful. I'd like you to repeat after me. You'd listen carefully. God, God, please help me here. Please help me here. I've made a mess of things. I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for your forgiveness. And promise to be more. Promise to be more. Obedient to you. Obedient to you. If you said that prayer, believe it. God is waiting for his children to come to him in all things. Not when we're down on our luck. Not when the car goes or the transmission goes. <laughs> Or when troubles come to us, God says, where are you in your joys? Where are you in the, in, in the things that, are, that bring you laughter? Where are the things that bring you hope? Where are the things that you struggle with? Come to me, my child. Throughout the, song, throughout the Psalms, no matter what David was facing, he poured out his gratitude to God, whether it was good times or bad times. David, if you read the Psalms, David had a lot. He had many, many struggles. If we carry an attitude of gratitude, we don't have to deal with the reaction alert. Alert that makes matters even worse. In most cases, it's like disciplining a child. We don't want to discipline our children. Now we have grandchildren I'm grateful for. I don't want to discipline my grandchild. Sometimes you have to. I don't want to do that. Why? it makes me feel just as bad. We know that it's good for that child, but I don't like that feeling. Reaction alert is when we make someone feel uncomfortable. We know the way, and in fact, only God knows the way, the truth, and the life. A reaction alert is when we said something wrong or made someone feel bad. Gratitude is a consciousness of awareness of doing the right thing. Gratitude is a consciousness and awareness of doing the right thing. Psalm 100, David writes, It is God that made us, and we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. So how can we be filled with gratitude? We know what the scriptures tell us. We know this. We're educated people. 
We know what the scriptures tell us. We know that we need to pray more. We know we need to praise God in all that we do. And most important, the words that flow from our mouth should only affirm those around us in our lives. We know all of this. But yet we slip. We fall back. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. It's not a destination, folks. It's a journey. All of us cannot be this wonderful, compassionate, understanding person all the time. We can't. We need to wear out our knees for God. We need to pray to God to come into my life and help me when I'm struggling. Help me when I don't feel like being a nice person today. Help me, Lord. There's something I'd like you to do this week. So I have two things that we're going to learn here this morning. This week, and every one of us can do this. I won't ask you next week if you did it. But as I said earlier, God knows our heart and our motive to why we're here. Why we do what we do. I'd like you to take time to send a card this week to someone that you don't care for. Someone that may have hurt you. It's easy to send a card to someone we love. We can all do that. I have a pile of cards, boxes, by my office, in my office. And I pick one out, sympathy, gentleness, kindness, courage, to send them out. But this is a little different. I'm asking you to send a card to someone that hurt you. Someone that's caused pain. I'm not asking you to say what you want to say. <laughs> so it's got to be a nice card. I would, I would encourage you to be led by a nice card. <laughs> but I'm putting that on you. I'm not going to check back and see if you did it. And Monday will come and you'll be reminding yourself a little bit. Tuesday, maybe Wednesday, you'll forget what the pastor said. Write yourself a note. Right now, today, write yourself a note if you think you're not going to remember within the next week. Busyness is not an excuse. It's a cop-out. I'm too busy. I didn't have time this week. It's a cop-out. We live within our priorities. And being here this morning was a priority for you. You all woke up and said, I'm going to that Lake George church this morning. Feel good and help make someone else feel good that you sent them a card. Finally, Philippians 4, 7. By doing these things, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you want God's love to guard your heart? Do you want God's love to be in your heart? Do something kind. Because you know it's the right thing to do. I said that I would give you a tip. Now here's the second thing I'm requesting from you this week. And this isn't this week. This is a habit. This is something to transform our thought process. Every correspondence that you send out to somebody, I would like you to start it with kind words and end it with kind words. A text, a message, an email, a note, whatever the case may be. Hello, Tom. Hello is a kind word. It could be, hello, Tom. I hope your week is going well. I hope your family is doing well. And end it with, Blessings. Or end it with some kind word. Here's the key. That reflects who you are. We can all do this. We don't have to do it if we're not comfortable with people. And I said earlier, some of us do this already. 
You don't have to communicate with people. You can do this as an everyday habit. Every email you send out, hello, Tom. I hope you're doing well. I hope you made it okay last week and things worked out with that talk you were supposed to give. Uh, oh, and by the way, why did I email you? You know. But at the end of the body of the email might be uh, blessings upon you and your family. It could be just blessings. It could be those that receive emails from me. I have a little thing I say at the bottom. In God trust. God's in quotations. In God trust. Something that we... And I will ask how you're doing with this particular one because it's a habitual thing. For us to change, we have to do things over and over and over again. They're not going to just happen. But it's changing our mindset. It's changing our mind and what we think and what we do because we're offering gratitude. Now here's an even tougher one. I'm going to take it to another level. I want you to do the same thing when you don't agree with a person or you don't really want to be nice to that person. You can still represent who you are. It isn't about wanting to get back at somebody so I'm not going to be kind. It's a matter of changing our thought process because God put every single human being on this earth and we're to love one another. We know this. Will you do this with me? Will you do this with me? I don't see a lot of bobbleheads going. <laughs> Furthermore, I know I need my mouth, my mind, and my actions to be evident to all that I love, all that I love. Father in heaven, how about you? My mouth, the words, my mind, and my actions speak volumes on who we are. Without going to hold the flag up and say, I love Jesus, on the street corner, it's our actions that will speak on who we are. It's the words that we speak. It's the words that we type on a piece of paper that reflect who we love. And I can assure you it will not take long if you choose this tip as a practice of life that people are going to say, what has happened to you? Something's different. All of a sudden you're saying kind words. And you're saying kind words to somebody that you don't really want to say kind words to. You'd like to say something else. But it's that opportunity to do that. Start and end with a kind word in all that we do from this moment forward. And I'll check back in a week or two on how we're doing. Amen? Amen. God bless this message.